Good morning, afternoon, and evening, and thank you for joining this month's WorkSoft webinar on how to fast-track automation with codeless process discovery. I'm Alicia Bell, Director of Marketing for WorkSoft and your host for today's webinar. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. Ty Henson is the Director of Solution Architects for WorkSoft. Ty has more than 30 years of enterprise IT and applications experience. He has served in a variety of development, QA, and leadership positions, providing him with an acute understanding of the challenges top firms face mitigating risk in complex systems. Ty has worked with WorkSoft products for more than 15 years and is a recognized expert helping clients realize the benefits of sustainable test automation. Today, he'll be discussing how to apply best practices for automated discovery of your business processes to create immediate value and accelerate project timelines. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Ty. All right. Thank you, Alicia. And welcome, everyone. Good day to everyone that is with us and for those that may watch the recording after the fact. The agenda is going to have us looking at what is successful automation, because that's certainly what we want to achieve. So to do that, we'll look at more closely what inhibits our ability to get there and, and succeed in our automation journey. To do this, we're going to introduce four best practices uh, for process discovery, primarily attacking one of those, those main inhibitors that, it, that is involved. And as you are familiar with us, you know that we often will demonstrate. Um, I'm actually going to, to jump into a live environment uh, several times throughout our session today. So I'm gonna do a, a combination of conceptual discussion and visuals as well as live demonstration to get our points across today. The message is quite simple, yet extremely valuable. So again, thank you for joining us. And in the end, we'll finalize with what does this really mean for me? So in getting started, what is automation success? Um, some of the requirements that, that we have set in working with our customers and in our many, many years of experience in, in working on automation is that we can often achieve more than 80% coverage in testing. And believe it or not, that's actually quite conservative. Um, in reality, um, we can automate anything that's tedious and repetitive and much of our activities throughout the day as users, whether that be for testing or for performing uh, business processes is, is that way. And especially even if there's um, data driving that those activities and decisions involved in those activities, those are still candidates for automation. So we've worked with many customers to achieve higher than 80% coverage, but we're gonna generally say that um, you've achieved success if you've gotten to that level and you're also engaging in the use of that automation to assist you, go beyond testing, but also assist you with your activities. Now, reaching that level is, is important, but sustaining that level is vital. Um, really, success is going to be in your ability to continue to maintain that level of automation um, with low maintenance and low cost to do that uh, and not having to apply an army to keep your automation alive. Um, when you've achieved that, then you will enjoy the benefits of being performant in business and really be able to focus on your business, business and be agile in change. So that's really the success that we're going for. Let's take a closer look at what inhibits our ability to get there. So the end result of this short list is going to be a little bit debatable, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that when we get there. But the first thing that I'm going to posit is the is the most important, is the accuracy of the automation coverage. When we are not accurate in what we are automating, then we have gaps in that coverage, and that can be problematic to our success story in the end. Um, in the end, uh, in, and from some of the polling, 46% say knowing what to automate is the barrier to implementing automation. Um, and it's really about, okay, I've chosen a solution, I'm comfortable with my choice, but now where do I begin? And unless your solution is assisting you in that way, then that in itself becomes an inhibitor to getting started. The next, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even show my detail there, but um, is my automated process complete? How do I know I've captured all the steps and am I automating the right things? Those are some of the questions that come into play as you get underway and experience this inhibitor. 
The next one is the speed of building automation. And 69% of people uh, polled from SAP Insiders cite that uh, the speed of testing to meet business need as a key criteria for engaging automation. And it is a logical thought to think about how fast can I build up my automation because that's going to certainly be something that is, is a measurement um, that I'm interested in. And, and it's important that I'm able to achieve my objective quickly and that I have something that will in fact allow me to build automation quickly. But also if you think about it, I've got it in, in position two um, and it is important because getting out of the gates and being successful immediately is, is extremely important for adoption. And we want everyone to be thinking automation is helping us be successful in our initiatives. So if we're not successful immediately, then we do struggle with adoption. And that's why I've got it in the number two position. But in reality, building the automation in theory is a one-time operation that then lives on. So one of the very important inhibitors as well that we're getting to is going to also be the sustainability of that resultant automation. And 72% polled fear the time required to maintain automation. Now that's very interesting because of the fact that automation has been around for a very long time. So in reality, why are we all not 100% automated at this point? But it is very much to do with these inhibitors. And we've been growing up in the automation space and learning how to do this successfully. In terms of sustainment, how much time will be spent on the maintenance? Can it adapt to change easily? And what's the impact of, of broken bots and broken automation? Well, interestingly enough, and the debate that I wanted to, to bring up um, that I mentioned in the beginning was that each of these percentages actually went higher as we went lower in my priority list. So um, sustainability in my position three is 72% where um, the speed of building was 69% and the accuracy was 46% in terms of, of people being polled. And if you think about it, when you go on an automation search, it is really number two and three that you're mostly considering in looking for a solution. But what we wanna talk about today is that the primary inhibitor is in fact the knowledge about the application and the accuracy of the automation coverage and being able to answer those questions of where do I start and am I covered? Because you could be running a lot of automation, but if you're not covering exactly what your users are doing, then you still have gaps. And, and gaps are um, the problem uh, keeping us from that full success. So what I'd like to introduce are some best practices to assist with the primary inhibitor. And really what we're gonna be talking about, obviously I am from WorkSoft and um, everything that we do is all about trying to solve the, the problems and, and reduce the inhibitors uh, in terms of successful automation initiatives. Um, so I will be speaking in terms of what our solution provides. And as of late, that is our connective automation platform. There are gonna be some things that I'm gonna talk about that are um, involved in various areas of your automation initiative. So we're, we are going to experience that a little bit throughout, but in reality, it's all predicated on this initial discovery and understanding the information and the activity that our users perform so that we can go after automation of those things very comprehensively. Okay, so to get started, best practice number one, engage the business users for knowledge capture. Okay, seems quite simple. And actually I'm gonna use this opportunity to um, create a little bit of an origin story of, around how WorkSoft conceptually thinks about the automation and, and how we um, go after uh, helping you achieve higher levels of success. So to do this, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about this concept of capture. In reality, we're our position is that automation is for everyone. Um, whether you're using automation for testing in QA or in the TCOE, um, or you're using automation for um, uh, assisting your users with activity or robotic process automation known as RPA, it is important that the automation involved is completely accurate to exactly um, the need. So let's think first about testing. 
Um, you guys may remember, if you've heard any of my prior webinars, that I've referenced um, uh, a story about uh, selling automation at one point, and, and a gentleman was quick to tell me, uh, I'm not sure I need your automation because I've got 6,000 testers. And that was quite impressive. But um, what he was referring to in the end and, and uh, elaborated for us uh, eventually is the fact that he has 6,000 production users. Well, in reality, it's too late to discover those problems in production. It's too costly um, to discover those problems in production. So um, the concept was a good one. It just wasn't being applied correctly. And what I mean by that is if we could pull those 6,000 testers into a pre-production environment, then we certainly could know with confidence if any changes we're making to the system are going to adversely affect those users when in fact they're using the same application in production. So capture is our ability to now start enlisting the help from others. So many companies will talk about a recording mechanism. That's where the concept began, but our capture is really more than just record. And so um, let's start our origin story in the live environment, and then we'll expand on that a little bit as we go. I'm gonna pick on a few different applications today. I thought I would start with the SAP GUI. It's a, a well-known um, thick client for um, the SAP ERP system. And as well, I'm gonna bring up our automation editor. But when I, when I speak about this from like an origin story, where I'm coming from is the fact that we recognized long ago that we needed a facilitated way to build automation. And recording was the initial concept, but we really took that well beyond recording because what we do um, is done in a very sustainable way. So we needed a mechanism that would allow us to monitor the user and build the automation in the certify way, which is our object action framework. And that's exactly what we have provided. And we've enjoyed this within our automation solution for some time. So what I'm doing is I'm launching what we refer to as capture. And I wanted to start fairly tactically around what is codeless automation and what is capture that is facilitating the build of this automation. And so by simply clicking on the recording button and acting like a user with you together here in this exercise, I'm gonna head down the path of creating some uh, steps or really just performing some steps. That's, that's the better way to put that as a user. And what we're witnessing over in the capture window is that it's monitoring my activity and it's building an English statement to reflect exactly what it sees happening in each one of those steps. We started by putting in the transaction code, then I input OR into the order type field, uh, 1710 into the sales organization, et cetera. Everything that I perform as a user, it's going to collect those steps. Now at the moment, this is less about the process and more about the capability. So what I'd like to do is bounce over also to another transaction within SAP, which we are commonly doing. And I simply wanted you to witness the fact that it's going to follow us across that boundary and start to even segregate a little bit, but build the steps for that transaction as well. Well, in the end, the user can simply save this um, exercise. I'm gonna call this my capture. I'll keep it very simple for today and click on OK. And I started from the automation editor. It was a right-click operation to bring up capture. And so it's taking me right back to the editor and it has in fact brought back the capture that we built together. So we're gonna bring up capture and we can see that we have collected all of those steps and we have recognized that we went through various transactions along the way. And in the end, it is very quick and easy for the user to perform the activities one last time manually and as a result, immediately have the automation. And that's the box that I primarily wanted to check with you today is that the automation um, now exists from that capture experience. In fact, if I click on the run button, the application is still available. We are gonna see it cycle through those steps and re-perform them the exact same way that we captured them as a user. Now, I realize this is a very simple example, but um, what I'm really trying to get across the table here is that uh, as a result of capture, we are immediately building the automation and we take this up to much larger levels. In fact, we can represent those users in full 
And you can see that we have the ability to allow users to participate in the process through this capture experience. So I'm not gonna belabor the, the conversation about the automation itself. One last little nugget that I'm gonna say, because we're gonna focus more on this discovery, which is eliminating that inhibitor to our, our success in our, in our automation initiative. Um, but the way that we do this automation um, is actually aligned with another inhibitor, which is the ability to do this with low maintenance. So I wanted to touch on this very briefly. Capture is listening to the user performing the activity. And in our case, what it's doing is it's learning the object from the application. Now we can do automation for pretty much anything in your Windows operating system. And as you touch different technologies, we are going to learn different types of objects, but that's what allows us to get back to that object and then re-perform the action that we witnessed from the user. In fact, just to take it a little bit further, we, we set the action, but the other actions that become available become part of a dropdown. So when you're talking about maintenance, you're talking about um, simple combo boxes to make different decisions around what action is actually being performed. Um, the way that we're oriented here with our object action framework, we are not using programs to test programs. Because if you think about that logically, in that case, either can be broken. We are using our object action framework um, to test programs, and that is much more sustainable, and that was one of the inhibitors that we were referring to. So just to give you a quick visual, um, our object action framework is going to automatically learn those objects, bring them into our central repository, and even reuse objects. Like to just give you a quick example, but keep it simple. If two users capture through, you know, they're doing different end-to-ends, but they happen to go through the same screen, our product is automatically going to recognize that they've captured some similar objects, and it's just going to store those objects once and link them everywhere that they're being used. So that, that object reuse is completely automatic, and actually what I'm saying runs the risk of making it sound more complicated because the, the engine is doing everything for us. But in the end, the reason that I'm mentioning that is because this is what provides for that true low maintenance uh, environment. We are no longer spending time um, updating or changing our automation regularly just to keep it alive. This is much more sustainable and the lowest TCO in providing for these tedious repetitive activities through codeless automation. Now I'll stop there on the automation front um, because I want to take us to the next level of our best practices, which you can see that Capture is allowing the user to begin to participate. I'm gonna just kind of clean up my desktop along the way. But let's bounce back to our visuals just for a second and take a look at what is the next best practice, which I am stating as Capture step-by-step -step user activities using digital photography. Now, I want to explain this just a little bit as we get into this particular best practice. Um, we absolutely have learned with best practice one that we can begin to involve the user. We simply, as a solution now, have made that extremely simple. And I'm going to elaborate for you um, both conceptually and a, a, with a little bit more demonstration. Now, the, the reference to digital photography, I wanted to kind of mention this analogy. Um, historically, when we would take pictures before we had digital photography, there was a clear expense in developing that photography. And so we were a little bit more selective in what we might choose to take pictures of. Um, we, we absolutely, when we capture, we do take pictures of objects. And so there's a little bit of overlap there too. But, but the, the message that I wanted to convey is that with capture, it is much more like digital photography in the fact that we can take as many pictures as we want to, and we can choose in the end what we want to retain. Um, and that's, that's the real analogy that I wanted to uh, bring to the table in this particular best practice. With our codeless capture, there really is no experience necessary. Um, there are some capabilities that we do uh, tell the user about, and, it, and they're so simple to work with. Um, that those users really are then deputized to control to some extent the, the content that they're providing. So 
Um, we'll talk about this in demo form in just a moment, but it's going to generally follow along as they perform these activities, as we as we quickly witnessed there with the GUI, and we'll do more together in just a moment. But it's also very flexible um, and and provides their opportunity if they need to to even correct a mistake, for example, and that's quite powerful. So this is where capture goes well beyond what we would historically have thought of recording because that is unheard of from a, a recording perspective. So capture is much different. Though similar, it is different. And it is our opportunity to do as much capture as we can and then choose as to how we're going to apply that. As you can imagine in today's session, as you're witnessing, we're gonna take that up a notch together in just a moment, um, even beyond this particular capture. Um, so as a result of capture, and this is what I also want to demonstrate and give you um, some live visuals of, but we, we have the opportunity to produce documentation of that activity, and actually in a couple of different ways. The visual um, represents a little bit of a Visio style diagram, and you're going to see a little bit of this along the way, but also what you might think of as documentation of these activities, literally step by step with imagery of screens and objects to represent, here's exactly what this user did in capture form. And we're gonna do this together in demo form um, in just a moment. And we're gonna also then uh, elaborate on the value that comes from this. So let's jump back into our live environment. And I thought I would pick on a few different applications for this purpose today. But the, the real key here is that I am going to launch what is called our business capture. And that may sound um, a little funny because that's what we were just using, but here's, here's the difference of what I'm doing now than what I did a couple of moments ago. A couple of moments ago, I used a right-click operation. In fact, I made it point to, uh, to say that out loud. Um, to bring up Capture. So the automation owners have been enjoying Capture for some time. Right within our solution, they can right click and bring up Capture and create automation very rapidly, such as we did together and witnessed. But um, a little while back, we realized in providing that value and needing to enlist the assistance from knowledgeable users, we needed to be able to distribute this. So we now have Capture also in standalone form. It is the exact same application, it's just wrapped different so that we can distribute it. And it doesn't require any other parts of our solution. So a user could have capture available to them on their desktop, and in this way, they could merely be a contributor into the process. Now, that seems so simple and logical, but um, in the end, if you really think it through, it's become quite powerful. As soon as we did that, we had the ability for production users to turn on capture, um, something I didn't say but should, our, our automation is agnostic to the environment. So a production user can turn on capture, they're just doing their jobs, but as a result, they're also building automation. So it's a total win-win situation. And what I'm going to be further elaborating for you on today is the fact that capture is providing even more than just automation. So there's a lot of great value that we're gonna witness together that comes from the user willing to turn on and perform capture. So that could be a production user, that could be a UAT tester, you know, there's more of a testing reference. It could be someone that needs to create a digital worker or an RPA bot. Um, they could turn on capture and perform that activity one last time to seed the automation with the steps necessary to do that on their behalf going forward. So we make it very quick and easy, and we do that um, throughout the, the various applications that you're gonna be working with within your operating system. So in this case, I'm still using SAP. I'm gonna go outside of SAP in just a moment, but I thought I would bring up Fiori, um, the you know part of their UI5 initiative, very important. But everyone, including SAP, is trending to the web. So Fiori is really just web content to us, and something that we can also um, see and, and build capture for. So what we're going to experience together as we go through here, bear with me one second.
Oh, there we go. And I was going to use the opportunity to let you know also that basically Capture, I didn't know if I was going to get to this level today or not, but Capture is listening to technologies. And so what we do as users is we perform these activities and Capture is designed to automatically um, pick up on that activity. Um, we can tell it to listen to web. We can tell it to listen to SAP GUI. We can tell it to listen to other things. And in the end, it's the responsibility of Capture to um, pick up on that content. Now, my website had timed out on me there, so bear with me. I tried to prepare in advance, but we've got time here for me to, uh, to get back in there for this purpose. was trying to avoid having to do some of the uh, sign-ons for you in this demonstration. Okay, so basically, get back underway and as we perform these steps as a user you can see that it's picking up everything step by step along the way and that's the intent is that captures responsibility is to monitor the user and pick up this activity the user should never have to do anything to accommodate for what capture is doing now in this particular demonstration I'm choosing to have them co-located side by side and many users will do that um, because that way they're well aware of what Capture is picking up on their behalf in performing these activities. Um, and in the end as well, there are capabilities that the user can perform if, for example, they've made a mistake. Um, I've just placed a Fiori order and I wanted you guys to witness that um, in terms of Capture following along and picking up all of these steps. Um, but let's, uh, let's insert a few things. And these are the things that I was talking about that the users can be made aware of, and then they have the opportunity to augment or deliver even more rich content in terms of the automation that's being built. Um, it, it starts with things like being able to enter comments. Let's say, for example, this is a manual testing experience, and I might, as the manual tester, say, um, validate that the net value has zeroed out after the save. So I experienced with one customer where their net value did not zero out after the save and it was adversely impacting the uh, resultant values of other orders that were adjacent in, in activity. So they began testing for this. Well, the user can insert that comment, but they also can use what we refer to as live touch. And when you turn on live touch, it's the ability for the user to hover over anything on the screen. We're gonna see that. And with a simple click, the user can insert a step to perform an action against the, um, that uh, object on the screen. So what I've just done quickly is I clicked on a couple of things. Let's verify the net value and let's verify the message bar to make sure that we're, our order has saved successfully. This is the opportunity for the user to insert things like that if they choose to along the way. Now, I, I'm quick to say that it's also not required. Um, in the automation editor, which we didn't go into the weeds in, it is just as easy to insert new steps or to drag and drop and reorder steps or to delete steps along the way. So this is almost like a mini editor, but you also absolutely have the ability to inject information at a later time. So as long as the user is simply willing to turn on capture and perform this activity, they are, they are going to provide some great value. And before I start to go further on what that additional value is, let's hit on at least one more website along the way. Um, I thought I would get out of SAP and we'll start a new capture. And this is what I tried to have uh, sitting there, but uh, they, the, my screens had timed out on me, so I apologize for that.
Okay, so Salesforce Lightning, you may or may not be using it, but it's a SaaS based complex HTML application. I like to pick on it. Um, we, we use it internally and therefore it makes it very convenient for me to demonstrate from. But similarly, I'm gonna turn on the recording button. And in this case, I'm not gonna go far. I'm just gonna start down the path as a user of um, performing the steps for uh, creating an opportunity. And I just wanted you to once again, see those steps coming together um, in the capture window. This is what it looks like to perform these captures. We've talked about this to some extent, and I just wanted to include at least one additional application for the purpose today to kind of check that box together. But, but you can see as we proceed, <clears throat> excuse me, step by step, capture is picking up exactly what's needed. And as we have witnessed, these steps can be saved and immediately begin being used as automation. So let's take that a little bit further together. As a part of um, collecting everything that we need to build the automation, we additionally have the opportunity to build that documentation. And that's what I wanted to really hit on and make sure was, was clear um, in our session today. So by a user willingness to turn on capture and go through their process, we started a moment ago going through a Fiori order. This is the type of document that can immediately be generated as the result of the user doing this. I do wanna point out kind of specifically at the top, we're starting to show the functional flow that the user performed in, in this capture uh, experience. Um, this will become more important in just a moment. What it is representing generally is the functions that the user went through so that we have an understanding that this is functionally what the user has performed and then as we scroll down the meat of the document begins with a screen capture from when capture was started it is bringing the narratives right that we were seeing right from the capture window into the document as well as object imagery when i say object it means you know those things on the screen that the user is interacting with and this document can be completely produced just from that capture experience. So now we have really kind of seen some insight as to the three very valuable things that are that are coming from capture. And let's hit on those things. When the capture is performed, we have step-by-step -step automation. Additionally, we have step or we have functional flow understanding of what exactly that user is doing and we have step-by-step documentation of what that user is doing. Now, many of you have probably heard me say this because I sound like a broken record often, but this documentation is what the users used to have to write in the past to give to a, a programmer to get something automated. And what we've just witnessed together and talked about is the fact that we have thrown technology at that problem. We have provided capture to allow a user to perform these activities and then automatically provide each of those assets that, that we um, are referring to here. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody dizzy. I do apologize. I'm gonna scroll down because in this particular one, um, we did insert the verification, for example, of the net value. I just wanted you to see that that becomes even part of the documentation. And then as well, we bounced right over to the GUI. So the user, just brought up the, the Fiori browser, placed the order, brought up the GUI, um, SAP GUI, and then did the delivery. And we captured the steps for the delivery. We simply follow them across those application boundaries because Capture was configured to look at both technologies and um, automatically then collected that activity. Now, the second thing we did together was a Salesforce opportunity. Similarly, at the top, we are seeing this functional flow. Again, we're going to talk more about that in a moment, but screenshot and when capture started, um, step by step uh, information about exactly what we're doing to navigate into and start and build an opportunity within Salesforce. Now, these are processes that I have available to me and that I'm more familiar with that that actually um, points out exactly why capture is so relevant. I am typically bound to providing what I know. And the problem is that I don't know all of the processes from all of the different areas of my system. So what we're basically experiencing together is that we now have the opportunity to give capture to those knowledgeable users, whether they be in production 
or in pre-production and performing these processes for whatever purpose. They could be doing exploratory testing, they could purposefully be capturing something to turn it into automation, or they could be doing their jobs and capturing that as a result. And we have the opportunity to produce the documentation and the automation along the way um, from that activity. And, and so this is partly what I wanted to um, demonstrate in terms of the best practices that we're trying to achieve or that we're trying to apply. Okay, let's continue. Best practice number three, discover your scope for automated testing and RPA. Now, this is where I wanted to further step up the information that we're we're now capable of obtaining from our users to actually help guide where we need automation and in our solution in our connective automation platform we've provided for this capability we can drive automation based on actual processes we've learned together that we can capture it we've learned together that those things are documented and what i want to show you is that um, we've provided mechanisms now to even take that to the extent of holistically looking at the activity within the application so that we know that we can go after that activity with automation comprehensively. And that could be for testing and or for RPA. And I would like to explore that with you a little bit further, um, also in the form a little bit of, of some, um, some live as well. But before I jump back into the live, let's break this down in terms of those business processes that we know that we need automation for. We often feel like we understand what those processes are. In fact, we can even ask certain users, um, how do we do our order to cash process? And we will get some form of response typically in terms of here's how I perform that order to cash process. But what we've learned in logically applying all of this capability to our, our connective automation platform is that with our customers, we are experiencing that it is often the case that we don't exactly know what a particular process is or the fact that there really is quite a bit of variation typically in terms of how those business processes are being performed. And this can come naturally by exploring the activity with the users, you know, historically, once again, um, it would have been a time and motion study, the very costly, very time consuming. And in the end, what we're really doing is interviewing users, you know, actually much like that, uh, this uh, visual at the top right, where you're often putting sticky notes on glass walls and, and working together to establish, yeah, this is exactly how we do our process. But in reality, that comes from their recollection and their perception of how that's being done, and perception is not always reality. So what we've experienced in enhancing our solution to the extent of, of accommodating in this way is that we've created what we refer to as process intelligence. Process intelligence is a part of our solution where we now centrally store those captures. And as we perform the capture uh, together before, I, and created the documentation for that. I was pointing out the activity boxes at the top. And the reason I did that is because that is now also readily available right within process intelligence. And as you can imagine, this is a capture. This is a user turning on capture and going through these functions. And we're looking at that from a functional perspective. Now let's enhance this concept. If, this, if another user turns on capture and performs the same functions, the picture will not change. We will increase the frequency numbers, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, but we will, the, the picture would still reflect that this is functionally how that process was performed. But what we're really enjoying in working with our customers and, and providing process intelligence is that as we release capture into the field and key users start cre uh, capturing their activity, I am filtered down just to my order to cache space here at the top, I wanted to point that out because what we're witnessing is these are alternate captures coming in from varying users doing various functional flows to perform orders in this system. And in fact, um, it was a little mind numbing to begin to realize that, in, that 
the number of variations can be quite extensive um, in certain areas. It, it, the spaghetti here is almost too blurry to uh, to understand. We would have to drill in and start to uh, to analyze this, which we do have the capability to do. I'm going to simplify the picture for the moment, but the best practice that we're going after here is is discovering the scope of your automation through the activity of your users. So when we perform capture, or when our users perform capture and store them centrally, this is provided automatically. This is not more work that we need to go do. This is more information that, that this platform is surfacing for me. And I have a much better understanding now of exactly what my users are doing. And you may recall that in the beginning, we were talking about if we could test the system exactly the same way the users use the system, then we should have no gaps in testing. And it, and it extends even into RPA, and I'll get there in just a moment. But before I do, let me show you that the capture activity is very easy for us to surface and, uh, and reflect in this way. And we are simply going to scratch the surface, but there are many additional things that we can do within process intelligence. Um, we can begin to turn on frequency and see what are the more common flows versus less common flows that are happening within this spaghetti mess. We can turn on duration. And as I drill in, I have tolerance sliders that I can use to begin to understand where do I have slowness, not only within certain activities, but between activities. And, and what am I possibly interested in? The other thing too, is that some of these boxes are just white and some of them are blue. And I wanted to point out that, that that difference is a reflection of the fact that this particular set of data, this customer that we're working with, has started to use the automation for the blue functions. And that's what turns them blue. Some of you are familiar um, with our capabilities. I'll keep this very quick, but I'm going to just bounce over to our continuous testing manager. I just wanna give you a quick visual if in fact you have not seen this. And of course, the faster you try to go, the slower it's going to be. There we go. In our continuous testing manager, there, there are various ways to run our automation, um, but we try to make that quick and easy and, and provide for it, um, keeping you productive all the while. So what I mean by that is typically what we're gonna do when we run automation is run it in a virtual background. That allows us to do a lot more testing in much shorter windows. And in terms of the controls, we have the ability to not only choose what we want to run, but, but whether it can run in parallel or if we wanna sequentially control that, if it should run just when we kick it off or if we wanna set a schedule for every few minutes, every few hours, daily, et cetera. Um, this is what allows us to interact with our DevOps realm because we have an API call that allows us to um, let our CICD pipelines kick off our automation and then make sure that everyone that needs to be is notified in terms of what's happening. And just to give you that visual, there is a spy window. Though I remain productive on my desktop, I can bring up the spy if I choose to. And in this particular case, really all I wanted you to see uh, primarily is that it started two different sessions. It's underway and getting them signed in for the purpose of running this automation in the background. And what the spy is typically going to do, it takes a moment to kind of get underway, but um, then it's gonna run pretty rapidly through the automation and it's gonna give us a desktop screen capture every few seconds. So this is not a real time monitor by any means, but um, often when we're running things in, especially in a virtual background, we're wondering, um, what is the status of that? And so here you can see we're starting to get some screenshots coming through. This one is signing into Fiori. We were doing some captures in Fiori earlier. So this is doing testing on that um, space. And then if I bounce back over to Worksoft 2, this one's signing into Salesforce. So this is a very quick way for us to run any amount of automation. In fact, we're extremely scalable in our ability to do this. Well, Though that was a little bit of a branch, I wanted to make sure you were well aware that that is so easy to accomplish because when you run the automation, that's what makes it turn blue. And that's when we begin to get credit for um, the automation that we're running. So to talk more about that, I need to get us to our next and um, uh, final um, best practice. But before I do, what one last um, nugget on this activity that we collect from captures is the fact that 
by collecting all of that and bringing it in centrally, looking at the thickness of the lines in terms of frequency, looking at the green, yellow, red in terms of the timing, this gives us an opportunity to understand what are the candidates for RPA and are we comprehensively testing against all of our user activity? So first, let's do that in reverse order. The blue boxes are where we've begun to use the automation. So um, it would be great if our solution would give you a percentage of exactly where you stand in coverage. Well, in fact, it will. And I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. But especially as we talk about the RPA space, if we're looking at the user activity and we're beginning to understand high frequent uh, or very frequent activities that where there's even slowness involved, it's not a guarantee, but those are certainly candidates for RPA. It is where should we look first in terms of going after RPA with my company? And so when we use these activities as RPA, they turn green. And that's why this box is both blue and green. It's being tested with our automation, but we also have a digital worker that is capable of performing this function on behalf of the user in production and assisting with that business process. And we have this holistic picture built right into process intelligence where we have we can easily understand that and manage to that along the way, which leads us to our last best practice which is that we want you to align your process optimization, testing, and RPA initiatives. Now, let me start by saying that we are well aware that this is often three different initiatives being performed by three different teams. But in reality, there is overlapping value that comes from this. And so the analysts are also recognizing that, like for example, from Forrester, 76% of organizations plan to leverage digital process optimization to drive end-to-end -end automation in some form. Um, ironically or not, uh, we completely agree, but we also think that that your automation effort can help drive your, your process optimization. So let's take a, a closer look at that. We've begun to see how process intelligence can collect the captures from the user, giving us insight into exactly what those users are doing. We've talked about how we can make sure that we are comprehensively testing from a coverage perspective by having that understanding. We've talked about we can look for candidates for RPA, things that are frequently done yet time consuming for the user, and can we apply automation to assisting us in those ways. And yet that knowledge also, you can picture that spaghetti that we were just looking at. If we could just make that spaghetti a little bit more efficient, then we could save money as a company. And that's exactly what process optimization is going to come from. So I'm, you know, in, when I reversed that uh, statistic just a moment ago from Forrester, you can imagine that by going after automate and testing and having your users capture all of that activity, that is going to give all of that spaghetti data to your digital transformation team on a silver platter, and they have everything that they need to get started in terms of looking into process optimization. And a little bit goes a long way. There can be really great savings that come from that, which is the last thing that I wanted to expose you to. In terms of aligning those initiatives, our process intelligence rolls up to a dashboard that makes that very easy and we're very excited about this. So let me break this down briefly. I'm not gonna go too far into the weeds today, but we've been talking about automation and everything that we do is very much predicated on that and the information that comes from it. In our dashboard, we can work with you to recognize going after process optimization. So that would very much be talking about turning the spaghetti into a much cleaner picture. And in terms of getting there, the spaghetti we can quantify. The potential savings is basically what we witness from your system, from your user's activity, in terms of what's being done, what your potential savings could be if you were to make that more efficient. We often go after 3% um, optimization in the beginning. Pretty conservative, yet extremely valuable. And we help you measure your journey along the way. So that data that we were looking at is what your users start with. It's great information to get them started and to go after this initiative. And we're gonna help you measure that journey. Similarly, in the very next section, we're going to roll up and show you 
your automation coverage. And this is exactly what I was referring to a moment ago, the blue boxes versus the white boxes. Where we're using the automation, we get credit for that. And so we can say you are 12% automated at this point. And for the parts that are not automated, we can quantify the savings that can come from that. And for the parts that are automated, we can show you real time your realized savings. Now, this is not intended to be down to the penny. You can configure weighted costs for your resources. This is a very simple calculation. We're measuring things like frequency, amount of time or duration, and, and um, general cost of the resources involved. But it's a simple calculation that is, that, be, that is measured real time so that it's always at your fingertips to know, here's the value of the automation that we're using and applying in our system. And it all can come from that discovery process that comes from our users. Last but not least, RPA. Um, and I keep referring to overlapping value. You know, your automation effort can give your, your process optimization great data and vice versa. Your automation effort can also seed your RPA initiative. You can reuse your automation assets and facilitate RPA initiatives in that way. But regardless, um, well, and also you can turn on capture and build that automation very rapidly. So we're, we're really good at helping you do this quickly. And we're similarly going to help measure your journey along the way, not only the percentage of where you're at in your journey, but the realized savings that come from that. And this is really what we mean by aligning your efforts um, in terms of, I wanna go back to that slide because it is important. Um, it's it's something that, that um, we have built up to and we are very proud of and we know is extremely valuable and now we're trying to shout it from the mountaintops. So, our solution, our connective automation platform is making this more easy to accomplish, and it's going to help you align your process optimization, testing, and RPA initiatives as a company for all of that great savings. So in summary, let's get, let's because uh, I want to uh, get wrapped up here and um, make sure that we can take a couple of questions at least. Um, in the agenda, I think what I really put is, what does this mean to me? And I realize I may have a mixed audience, right? Some of you may be literally working on automation and may have seen some great stuff that you're interested in. And others may own the automation and may be more interested in the dashboard and the and the initiatives around the savings. Um, in the end, it, it's all connected. And we all should care very much about not only the ability to do it quickly, the ability for it to be sustained, but to rely on the accuracy because it can come directly from the knowledgeable users that are involved. And that's the summary statement I wanted to make is about those three valuable outcomes that come from the WorkSoft process capture. So codeless step-by-step -step automation, we've witnessed it together. And I've, I inserted a couple of, of quick visuals just as a reminder. Um, it's building readable narratives. It's easy to maintain. It's easily data-driven and um, it's, it's automatically storing and reusing objects on behalf of the user to make sure that that maintenance stays low over time, the lowest TCO. Um, so comes, uh, it comes rapidly together from the knowledge of those users because we can distribute capture um, to their fingertips, whether they're doing that in production or in pre-production for any purpose. It's going to pro provide detailed documentation Let's say again, it's a, it's a UAT tester and they've experienced a problem. If they've captured it, they've got all of the material, the automated steps, as well as the step-by-step -step documentation for that to be triaged and mitigated accordingly. Um, if you're a production user, um, you're, you will have documented your process. You can use that for onboarding new employees and making sure that everyone knows how to, uh, to do this, um, this process uh, properly and, and help in that process optimization effort by having great documentation of exactly what the right process is for performing these, these activities. And the functional flow, which is not only cool, to be able to see, but extremely valuable comprehensively. And that's the, the final point we wanted to make sure to make is that when we bring this information together, it helps us align our initiatives around automation, both for testing and for RPA, and to understand where we stand in terms of process optimization. So the solution is the connective automation platform from WorkSoft, and it's, it's built around these best practices and helping you achieve great success in your automation journey. It starts with immediate value, 
when you turn on capture from the very first automation step that you build with us. Okay, great. Well, thank you for all that uh, great information on uh, process discovery best practices. Everyone have a great day.